Okay, I know you're not supposed to explain a joke, but uh, this is a little different. We're going to talk about um, how we wrote um, a sketch for the show. And uh, in so doing, maybe you can understand some of the thought process behind uh, telling a joke quickly. And this is from uh, Transylvania Television. Um, that is a sketch comedy. And uh, the way it came about is um, we did a pilot that had uh, sort of a standard 22-minute structure. But uh, then when nobody was paying us to make more of them, we decided to do web based things and those were short little one-offs little beginning middle and end a story short like some of them were 30 seconds some of them were eight minutes ten minutes so it developed into a sketch show um, in which there would be an a story no b story just here it is here's all the a finish it up on to the next thing so like a lot of situation comedies um, it has a stock set of characters but like sketch shows, there's a thing that happens and then it's done. Um, and you're on to the next thing. The situation goes as long as it needs to. So those 30 second ideas, fine. 60 second ideas, uh, eight minute, 12 minute ideas, those all fit in the scheme of things. But um, not necessarily the strongest way to go. That format came about out of necessity. So we had built up this body of work, lots of different individual sketches that weren't necessarily uh, connected in any way, but they could be thematically connected. So you could combine them into um, an episode and have them kind of feel vaguely related, mainly just out of happenstance since we're t t always writing about kind of the same sort of concerns anyway, the kind of geek, geek mentality concerns. So um, let's take uh, one of these as an example, and that's Space Paranoids. Whoa! Freaky Deaky has a game room? It's, it's right by the exit. How did I miss that? Well, you're always blind drunk when we leave. Oh. Yeah? Oh! They have Space Paranoids. I, I didn't even know these existed anymore. Hey! Hey! Give me a quarter. Huh? Oh. Give me a quarter. Come on, come on. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, all right. That's it. Make yourself comfortable. I'm going to have to put you on the game grid. Right. Huh? Oh. Well, that was worth a quarter. Oh man, this isn't happening. It only thinks it's happening. Tell me, program, what news from the game grid? What? I made it to the MCP on the first try? I finally made the big boss level. Dude! Science, I require data. My CPU has been separated from the greater computing realm for over 10 million cycles. What? 10 million cycles? That's, uh, what, uh, uh, that's like 1982. Precisely. What programs dominate the game grid now? Well, let's see. Um, Candy Ninja, Angry Turds, and uh, the Fruit Crush. No gladiatorial challenges? No frisbee combat? Oh, no, no, that never really caught on. But we got this killer disc golf thing, though. What about the light cycles? Tell me about the light cycles. Um, those I think we still have. All right then, what's it gonna be? The high line thing with the circles and the falling? Oh, oh man. Oh, I think he committed digital seppuku. Huh. Oh. Nope. Uh, for a long time, maybe since the beginning of the show, I wanted to do a parody of the 1982 Disney film Tron. It's one that I uh, was really affected by as a kid. Um, just the sort of imagination of it, the aesthetic of it, um, the fantasy, the design. So all of those things have been weighing on me for you know decades and just kind of a fan in general. And given that our show is about retro things, 
uh, it seemed a, a logical thing to do. And uh, the fact that I didn't necessarily have a big idea, something where it could be a 20, I mean, you really couldn't get 22 minutes out of this joke. So it was much more about sample, in and out, uh, off you go. And it's really just an excuse to kind of shoot something that looks like it. So for it, uh, the obvious thing would be to take one of the characters and get him sucked into the game. So what do we need to do to get that? What we have is a, it's a situational sketch. It's a parody. So for parody, you might look at uh, making a list of all of the things that are essential about that thing that you're making fun of. And remember, making fun of something um, is one thing. Loving something and making fun of it is another. Uh, you know, I point to something like Mel Brooks with Young Frankenstein. He had a and needed a love of that to be able to sustain a joke for as long as that film runs. So my list might be, I just, I wanted to do the aesthetic. So that meant some kind of blue screen, green screen phenomenon where we're adding the glows and things like that. So that's, that's easy. That's the look. Can't much make a joke about that. The outfits, it would be un, uh, pr impractical to put the puppets into track suits so that wasn't gonna, was never going to be part of it, but uh, I had a, a helmet that was too small, so it would work for one of the bigger characters. So that's easy. Um, maybe you can't make a joke about it, but uh, you've got part of your aesthetic built in. Light cycles, to me, is like quintessential Tron stuff. Throwing that Frisbee thing is quintessential Tron stuff. Uh, you need to see somebody get sucked into the computer, and maybe they go up against the big uh, super boss guy at the end, the MCP master control program for those uh, who are new to the process here. So a typical sketch like this is going to be three beats. It's going to be a setup, the conflict, and then the payoff for punchline. So for ours, the setup is for getting sucked into the machine. Pretty straightforward. We might need to know a little bit more about the how that occurs, where it's happening, why is he near a machine that's sucking him in, stuff like that. So we'll take care of that. Uh, the conflict... I decided that um, since the premise of the, the Tron sequel was that that grid environment grew up independently of the Internet, which I think is a great way to ignore everything that's happened since the Internet uh, existed, which for Tron fans, that's like a really good, <laughs> it's a positive thing. Um, so the MCP, that uh, master control program, would be really out of touch. He'd want to know what's going on in the world because he's got, he's got no email, he's got no Internet. I can make a joke about email there um and then the payoff is that he's probably not very happy about the way things go went because they they don't look anything like his aesthetic anymore um and it's it's old guy joke it's i don't love it if the world didn't turn out looking like tron i'm not i'm, I'm less excited about it so okay so the setup is you usually start our characters from a status quo they work at a television station so you've got um all of the things involved with that. So it could have been something that happened at the station that could be running Tron or something. Um, but they also have a uh, bar that they go to, a tiki bar in the um, in the neighborhood called the Freaky Tiki. And so for this one, we decided, oh, well, okay, there's a game room. Um, how come I didn't see it? Well, there's a joke there. Where are we? Um, Freaky Tiki. How come you haven't seen this before? Maybe we can make a joke about that. It's right by the exit. How did I miss that? Well, you're always blind drunk when we leave. Oh. Um, which characters we choose is going to be an essential part of this. Uh, what's the dynamic between those characters? Um, who do you pair? And some of that is, you know, who's the operator of those puppets? Who's available to do that sketch? But for me, it's usually like, who are my favorites? Or what is the, what is the joke best served by? Who... Who would best say that joke? And if you look at sitcoms, you can see that happening. Like, here are these little throwaway jokes. It's a big ensemble cast, and everybody's sitting in the room, and there's somebody on the couch, and they, they only have one line in the scene, but it's the line that's best said by that character. So it's a pretty typical um, shortcut for writing these things. And then in the setup, there has to be something that sort of changes and throws us into the conflict. Um, What's interesting about this one is uh, I chose Furry and Von Bucket. Furry's kind of the audience surrogate. He's an every man and every Yeti, so it's easy to write from him. 
he can experience things the way the audience experiences them. So he's the, he's really the lead character of the show for that reason. But you could have paired him with just about anybody for this to work. Um, I knew that he needed to have a quarter in order to... Uh, first, you put a character in there so that he can have somebody to talk to. It could be furry by himself monologuing, but it's just funnier to have somebody to play off of. It could have been anybody who had a quarter to put into that machine. Technically, Von Bucket probably... Somebody would have caught me on this if this had gone into the writer's room. Von Bucket never has any money. He's always trying to scheme to get money. He's always borrowing money. He would probably never have a quarter in his pocket. But I choose not to get hung up on that kind of stuff because of the next part of this, which is the punchline of that setup, which is he puts in the money for he disappears. Oh. Well, that was worth a quarter. That could have been delivered by anybody. LeShock would certainly have had a field day with that the vampire who's in charge of the station but he doesn't go to the freaky tiki for any reason um and you know i don't want to get into the, like the technical reasons why a vampire doesn't go to a bar I, it's just he's the boss and it would be uncomfortable for him to be at the working class place probably that's a whole sketch that he could come to there and everybody's kind of put off by it it's also a bowling alley so he could be really great at bowling um it could have been batfink his buddy who says that but um, Von Bucket was my pick because um, there's good dynamic there. And then we want to see him get sucked in. So the him getting sucked in is a direct, like, how was it done in the movie? Let's just go ahead and do that. So prior to that, we're not saying, hey, this is a Tron parody. Somebody probably recognizes the video game and goes, well, that's, that's the Tron game. That's kind of funny in, in and of itself. But as soon as he gets the POV of the MCP looking out with the text which is ripped right from the movie and the voice, the deep voice. Anybody who's seen the movie is going to go, oh, okay, I see where this is going. And then if it pixelates him exactly as it was done in the film, then more, more the merrier. Our conflict is that the MCP wants data. So out of that, we can get a couple of jokes. We have a Tron fan service joke, which is just him saying a line straight from the movie. Oh man, this isn't happening. It only thinks it's happening. We make a joke about it being hard to reach the boss level here. Furry has reached the MCP immediately. And uh, as a kid, when I was growing up, uh, I grew up at the, I was like 10 or so when all the video game stuff started happening. And uh, my parents would give me a, a dollar's worth of quarters and I would lose it within like four minutes because I was such a terrible gamer so <laughs> lose and the Tron game was absolutely one of those I would never make it I would never cleared a single screen on that game so for me that's a personal I have personal stakes in that joke and um, there's a there's an off character piece that furry is suddenly really good at math um, because he's able to calculate when how long the MCP has been trapped. Uh, that's like 1982. He's never shown any aptitude at, at anything intellectual, so that's maybe funny for anybody who's paying attention. So, conflict. MCP's been buried for X amount of period. What has changed since 1982? Well, everything, but let's focus on things that the MCP would be concerned about. So it's what are games like. There's this thing called the Internet. Computer power has obviously increased and uh, mobile games are you know the idea that you don't have to go to an arcade to play something is is pretty remarkable the fact that you can carry it around with you in your pocket so the fact that gaming is totally different um had already at that point by the time we shot this had been done very effectively by wreck it ralph the bit where he goes uh, immediately into the 64-bit you know warrior versus bugs game and is totally out of his element you can't do better than that, so I wasn't going to touch that. Um, the idea that the internet exists, that sounds like a whole different thing. Also, I'm worried about making internet jokes because they date super fast. Um, you know, I think when we did Le Shock on, Goes Online sketch, MySpace was just barely gone. And now we think of MySpace as this kind of it's like ancient history by now. So anything you say about the internet is going to be wrong in a few weeks. And for us, with the speed at which we produce these things, it's just better not to touch a joke like that. If you're doing a show where you can put it out weekly, then go for it, um, provided your audience is there to receive that information immediately. Um, you can make a joke about computing power. That's never going to get old because uh, Moore's Law. 
is um, always surprising us. So we could do a quick relatable bit about computing power. For us, that joke was the combining light cycles with the idea of a progress bar as you update Microsoft Windows or any any program. And then, uh, yes, mobile games are a thing. So maybe that's the that's the crux of it, which gives us our list. Um, list comedy is something that I uh, gleaned from years of Python, the cheese sketch, the parrot sketch, or just lists of things. The cheese sketch is lists of, of cheeses. Um, this, the parrot sketch is lists of ways to describe something that's dead. So I'm a fan of that. It's easy to do. Um, and it's sort of reflective of the writing process. You write down everything that you think is funny, and you could either pick the top three of those, or you could take that Python thing and go, I'm just going to say all of them, and if one of those lands great if you think one of those is funny super but if that one doesn't land there's another one that's two seconds behind it and it's sort of the strength in numbers uh thing one of these jokes is going to land with you so we do that we do that a lot and here we do a threes thing mainly because i don't know a whole lot of mobile games so we just kind of shuffled some naming things and you ended up with you know, ninja things and fruit. And and just as an example, how old is this sketch? A few years old. Is fruit ninja even a thing anymore? No, we've all moved on to something else. So it's very dangerous to write anything that's topical, I think, unless you're on a topical platform like one of these night nightly talk shows. And uh, by the way, if you watch a nightly talk show a year later or two years later, it's like it's coming from an alien planet. The, the, you don't even remember most of the things that were occurring back then. So um, that moves us on to our last part of that, the payoff. And we've got to get Furry out of there quickly. So he brings the MCP up to snuff on what's going on in the world. And the MCP promptly kicks him out of his digital realm. Um, Furry speculates that he committed digital seppuku in a bigger budget show. We could maybe see that. Um, he could fall on his light beam, you know, whatever. Um, I didn't want to animate anything except lip movement and the head turn. So I was like, what's the quickest way out of this? Gave him a very quick gestural thing like he's pissed off and poof, off Furry goes. I don't know if that, that joke ever landed, but that gets him out of the sketch and that's perhaps more important. And uh, we end with a little button or tag, which is some kind of concluding joke. Uh, usually very, very fast thing. And for this, I decided to go with a behavior that people recognize, which is when you're done with a machine, you check and see if the quarter went down. Nope. You know, very, very common thing. So maybe somebody will recognize that uh, from their own experience and react accordingly. So basically with our show, we have three possible things we could do. We can milk comedy from the situation. You know, for example, um, somebody going into a Tron thing is an interesting enough situation. It probably doesn't matter who that was assigned to. Um, you know, anybody who was there could have gotten sucked into it. It would have been just as funny. Um, it's not dependent on it being furry necessarily for that sketch to work. It could be comedy that is from the character's being themselves. So character versus character. Um, we've done plenty of that sort of stuff. And if the characters are well written, those things sort of generate themselves naturally. And then the third of those is where you get a blend of those situations. It's how does this specific character deal with that situation? So hopefully it didn't spoil the sketch in the process of uh, analyzing how we did it and what it's made up of. Um, you could do this with an, any of a number of the sketches from our show, but uh, single out this one as an example because uh, it's got elements of parody. It's got um, quick in and out structure and is uh, sort of uh, character, um, character revealing, we'll say, and certainly revealing of the people who made it um, now really getting up there in years and uh, still obsessed with the 80s.